it was a little, the weather was a little everywhere this morning. I said, oh, we're still doing this. All right, got it, <laughs> got it. I thought, I thought it was just a one day thing. Nope. All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started here in a few moments so that Lindsay can get all of her information out. All right, so um, good morning. My name is Shayla Hampton, and I am an SEO coach for Wayne Township. And I want to welcome you all to the Mental Health and Wellness Series for the 22. 22-23 um, school year, and it's sponsored by the Office of Special Services, Cummins Behavioral Health S Systems, and Project Aware. Um, thank you guys for being with us today. We're hopeful that you walk away with some valuable info and that you, you can use this info to help you in your role supporting staff and students. Before we begin, I just want to make sure that you know that questions should be asked in the chat. I'll be monitoring it as we go along to make sure that Lindsay um, can answer as many at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll try to get as many answer as time permits. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that we're going to go ahead and record these um, meetings and they'll be available in the OSS hub if you ever want to check it out again or share with a colleague. And also at the end of this meeting, you'll be able to complete an exit ticket where you'll choose a book that you can add to your personal professional library. We also will invite you to provide feedback, which is a valuable gift to us. Now, I am pleased to introduce Lindsay Cousy, the Education Behavior Coordinator for Cummins Behavioral Health Systems. And she's gonna talk about today's topic, which is grief and loss. Good morning, everyone. I will ask if you are not muted, if you could mute just because if I hear something, I might think there's a question and pop over. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you for that introduction. Yes, I am the Education Behavioral Health Coordinator with Cummins Behavioral Health. My position was created out of a grant opportunity because we saw that our students and our families were struggling coming out of the pandemic. Uh, we've had a lot happen in the last almost four years now. And we just have some things that are going on. So my role is to provide education, training, uh, professional development opportunities to the 150 schools that come in supports. Um, I've been in the field for about 20 years. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, a certified clinical trauma professional, a certified compassion fatigue professional, and a certified advanced grief counseling specialist. Uh, I've worked with individuals on uh, with intellectual disabilities, and I've worked in schools closely. Um, my background, I was a uh, education major in college as well, so I can 
somewhat, sometimes I can feel what you're feeling. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in a classroom, but um, I definitely try to, when we're looking at a mental health picture, really understand how educators um, have so much on their plates and, you know, then you have all these mental health things on top of it. So uh, I really am I'm grateful that you all reached out so that we could do these series. And today we're going to start with grief and loss. And before we begin, I want to identify that this is a heavy subject <clears throat> and it's sometimes an uncomfortable subject. We may have feelings that come up and that's okay. Um, I'll share some stories today that I may choke up on and that's okay. That's what makes it sometimes hard when people go through grief is we don't understand sometimes how to react in those situations, right? It's hard. I don't want to sit in that grief with you. I don't want to sit in that yuck because I have my own stuff that I, I haven't dealt with maybe and it's hard to sit there. All of that to say, if you need to step away, please do. If you need to debrief on anything, please reach out. Um, they have my email address. Feel free to reach out if there's anything that you need. We're going to talk about a lot today in a little bit amount of time. We're going to talk about empathy and sympathy. We're going to identify what grief is. We're going to talk about expectations in grief, cultural responsiveness, developmental perspectives, and then things to work on with youth. So as we enter this discussion about grief and loss, let's get into this mindset a little bit. What do we call the type of card you get someone who's experiencing a loss? Anybody want to unmute really quick and, and answer that? Sympathy. Sympathy, right? It's a sympathy card. Grief, again, is one of those spaces that it's hard to sit in with someone and so we're going to look at this quick video because even as clinicians, many of us were not trained in grief. Our supervisions didn't talk about grief. I had clinicians that were very young coming out of school. And as soon as grief was brought up, it was like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. It's like, we do. We do. <laughs> we're still sitting with them, but it makes us uncomfortable. And this is why we've been kind of, this has been ingrained in us that we're going to take this view. So let's check out this two minute video on empathy versus sympathy. Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened there. there. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us. It's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. 
if I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Every time I watch that, I find something new that, that I pick up from it. But as she talked about in that, this is what grief is for us. We are very sympathetic. We take food to those people, right? That's how we show that we care. We're going to take your food. We say those at least statements. At least you had 90 good years together. That doesn't matter, right? I've lost this person and now I'm struggling. I don't, I, I don't want to look backwards at the last 90 years and I shouldn't be happy, right? I'm missing this person. So we've just all kind of as a society become this sympathetic piece, not an empathetic piece when it comes to grief and loss. And so that's hard when we're dealing with a student or a family, or even if you're dealing together in loss because you've lost maybe a teammate or maybe there's somebody else at the school or in the district, right? It's hard when we're all sitting in this, but we don't really know how to talk to each other about it. Grief is the change that we didn't want. David Kessler worked with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who we'll talk about in a little bit. She's the one that had the five stages of grief. Well, David Kessler has come in and really talked about grief, and we need to find meaning. That's kind of our last place when we're, we're working through our grief cycle is through meaning. But this is just a really simple way to think about it. It's the change we didn't want. We didn't want to all not be in school because of a pandemic. We didn't want to look around and miss people. Right? We didn't want to deal with some of the stuff that we've had to deal with. So death and grief is not grief. Sorry, grief is not just death and loss. There are other pieces to it that we're going to talk about. So what does grief look like? Who we are is how we grieve. It's related to personality. Some people only experience a few emotions and others more. Things that might come up are hopelessness, anxiousness, feelings of going crazy. And we'll talk about why that might be in a few minutes. Um, lethargy, crying, right? There's all sorts of different feelings that people can have. I've been listening to a podcast. Anderson Cooper is doing an amazing podcast about his um, going through his mother's personal belongings after her death two years ago. Uh, he lost his dad when he was 10. He lost his brother when he was 21. And now he's going through all of these things. And he's he's kind of going through this path because he wants to normalize it. He wants to get this out there in conversations. And so he was talking with Stephen Colbert and Stephen Colbert said, grief is always with me. It's like a tiger sitting next to me, always there and unclear when it will pounce. It may come up in conversations. There may be a smell, there may be a sight, there may be something that triggers it that we don't really know how to explain. And sometimes we do. I'll give a personal example of this. Um, we lost our my brother-in-law a few years ago, and I have two boys. And my the the dream was always we're huge Cubs fans. If you can't tell, this is a picture of Wrigley Field in the background. Uh, we're huge Cubs fans, and our first trip to to Wrigley Field was supposed to be with him. Well, the, he passed away before the pandemic, or he died before the pandemic, and we didn't get to do that. Our kids were too young at the time. So we went to Wrigley Field this past summer for the very first time. My brother came with us. It was a beautiful thing, but there was sadness there because he wasn't with us and we knew that. So we knew going in, it was gonna be kind of sad until this person sat down next to me. This person that sat down next to me looked like, sounded like our brother-in-law. It was, it was the most amazing and triggering experience because it was like he was there. But it, it came up. We knew that this was going to be an incident because we're going to Wrigley Field and it was sad. But then to have this come and sit next to us, it was beautiful, but it was triggering. And so we had to talk about that. We're in this happy place with our kids. But then why is mom crying? Well, that's why. <laughs> so it comes up and we're not sure when it's going to pounce or how much it's going to pounce or if it's just going to swipe at us and walk away. I thought that was a really beautiful way to, to talk about it's always with us. And it's isolating. No one truly understands what I'm going through. What I say, you know, if I've lost a parent and this person's lost a parent, well, my relationship with my parent is different than your relationship with your parent. And so it feels like you don't know what I'm feeling, right? So there's different types of grief. Um, 
as you all have social emotional learning in your school, we talk about naming it to taming it, right? We talk about coping skills when we're helping with emotion regulation and recognition. Well, this is the same concept. It starts to tame some of those feelings of going crazy or feeling anxious, right? Knowing there's a name to what's happening and that other people must have experienced this if there's a name for it, it kind of helps us start walking down that path of healing. So the first one is anticipatory grief. And this is really where Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief was, was started. It was really identified for those individuals who that they themselves were having anticipatory grief due to illness or Alzheimer's. The idea that she had when creating those five stages was not for people to move linearly through them, but that it was supposed to be, you could pop between them, you might not use them, but it's really kind of morphed and really not used much in the counseling world anymore. Many of us went through anticipatory grief through the pandemic, right? We were grieving before it happened. We were grieving maybe the loss of, of, of things that were coming or we were worried about family. We were having that grief built up before things even happened. Next is delayed grief. And this is when your grief may be postponed for some reason. Think about this with an without answers. This is loss without answers. Suicide, homicide, other legal concerns. Delaying grief is avoiding painful symptoms within. This could also look like back-to-back -back losses, traumatic loss, child loss, feelings you can't grieve within your family system. They're postponed. But then when something triggers it and it floods, it could come out as panic attacks, agoraphobia. It could look hidden. It could be, where is this coming from? And it could be coming from delayed grief. Traumatic grief is that sudden loss, focusing on the nature of the loss. How prepared were you for the loss? Did you witness the actively dying process? Um, we've had a lot of loss in our family. My sister-in-law also has passed away. And I was in the room with her. Uh, as she was actively dying. And to not be prepared for that, that could be a really traumatic thing. If you don't know, you know, what to expect or what's happening, that's a lot. And with some of our families, they may have had their, their, you know, their students or their children in the room with them when a grandparent's passing away or, or somebody in their family. And then that child, that's what they see. You know, that, that confusion of, those last breaths, or maybe they made sounds, and, and that could be a scary thing. And that could be some traumatic grief for them, intrusive images, car accidents, seeing things, right? This may be some of the toughest situations, not only for us, but for those we're helping. Michael Lewis is the author of Moneyball. He's a financial journalist. And he talked about when he lost his 19-year-old daughter suddenly in a car accident, and he talked about how many of his friends reached out to see what they could do for him, but he didn't know, right? He was going through traumatic grief. This was unexpected. I don't, I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. But he highlighted that one of his friends said, I will just be at your house. I'm here for you when you need you. When you need me, I'm just going to be in my car outside your house. And he said that was the most um, helpful situation because he did end up going outside to the car and he just sat with him and cried. And that's what he needed in the moment, but he couldn't tell somebody else like, hey, I, I need to cry right now. Can you come over? That's not how it happened. So sometimes with traumatic grief, us just being present can be comfort, even if people aren't seeking you out. So the piece with grief is it is not something that therapists can bill insurance for unless you have persistent complex bereavement related disorder. So grief therapy is pretty privileged because you're either working with somebody at your school, so your, your school social workers, your school counselors, or they're paying out of pocket for it, unless you're finding places like Brooks Place or there's some other places out there. Otherwise, you're, you're paying for it. Persistent complex bereavement-related disorder also does not start until 12 months after the death. So you're looking at going a full year of dealing with these symptoms and increasing symptoms, trying to work, trying to do everything else. And then that's when insurance can kick in to pay because that's when it's diagnosable. Excuse me. So that's a really difficult piece to kind of think about when I was going through all my grief training. That's what kept coming up for me was, how is grief not something that we all can, can access services for easily? 
Next, we're going to talk about disenfranchised grief. And this is a loss of a relationship that's outside the typical structure. Examples of this are abortions, miscarriages, unrecognized relationships, pet loss, suicides, homicides, um, overdosing. This is grief you feel you cannot share for fear of judgment of you or your loved ones, right? Abortion is a really polarizing topic right now. How can I talk about that with people when I don't know how you're going to react because of what's happening in our world, right? I lost, if I lost my pet, how is that even relatable to you know, grief of you who maybe have lost a parent. It's hard in those situations because you feel like maybe your grief is lesser or I'm not, I don't feel like I should be able to grieve because maybe it was choice, right? Non-death grief and loss also falls here in job loss, ends of relationships, chronic illnesses. A lot can fall under here because a lot of this is things that we feel we can't talk about. This could also be where trauma falls, loss of a caregiver due to neglect or maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend that leaves the family. How am I supposed to talk about me being sad that mom's boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever left the family when mom's not sad about it, right? So we see a lot of that when it comes to some of our kiddos that might be going through some of those trauma pieces. Ambiguous grief is really where there isn't a body to know that they're gone. So it's it's the 9-11, it's missing. It's holding out hope that they're walking the earth somewhere. This is similar to disenfranchised grief because it's lonely, it's unsure, sometimes it's invisible. And so this is really figuring out how to process those steps without them being, you know, without challenging them holding on to hope. Collective grief is twofold. So one is grief by an individual with many historical losses. So this is generational loss or generational grief. Um, right now in our, you know, the, all over the media is what's been happening with Kanye and his, you know, his statements about Jewish, the Jewish population. And that um, Josh Gad posted um a really beautiful post about his grandparents who who were in concentration camps. And it just is bringing back that generational grief, right? So collective grief is, is something like that. Another definition of collective grief is um, larger pandemics, war, natural disasters, and loss of celebrities. So we just lost, you know, the, the world just lost, lost the queen, Betty White, right? There's all of these people that the world just kind of stops for and mourns. A large part of this grief is lack of control and being worn out at the same time. So even though we may have been in collective grief, it doesn't mean we also didn't have other grief too. Grief can be compounding and overlapping. Collective grief and anticipatory grief really fit hand in hand through the pandemic. If they're, you know, through war and the uncertainty that's been going on, I mean, we've had Ukraine that's come up. Those individuals are going through collective grief and anticipatory grief. So it's not just one or the other, it's all together. So what are the things that you think about when someone talks about expectations and grief? For me, those things include timelines, um, you know, kind of getting past things. We all talk and we all are there for people in those first, you know, maybe week or month after the loss of somebody. And then we kind of get quiet and we just, if we're not living in it, maybe we assume that they are also past it. So we live in a world of comparison. We naturally compare. Well, it's my dog. It's not my parent, right? It's Really important to remember that the worst loss is your loss, and it's an individual experience, and there should not be expectations. If you lost your animal, if you lost your cat or your dog or whatever, and that was a really big support for you, maybe you live alone, and that is the, the animal you come home to every day after work, and now they're not there, that's a big hole. You don't have to compare that loss to anybody else's, and that's the same when we're working with our students. Their loss is their personal experience, and there's no comparisons. So other things we're going to talk about are timelines. So as you're working with students or families who have experienced loss, here's some expectations we're going to kind of 
to talk about. There are no timelines. It takes longer than those outside of grief think it will take. Processing the change takes energy. Figuring out all that's happening and all of these other things we're going to talk about is really fatiguing. Processing that change takes energy. Relationships. What's changed, right? Unfortunately, those around who don't know what to do don't really understand this piece. So again, going back to some of our, our students who may have some families that there's a boyfriend or a girlfriend that's kind of rotating in and out, what's changed? So now there's this new person. What's this relationship look like now? Secondary loss are those tangibles. So is the is the person that left, were they the moneymaker in the house? And now what? I had a student in um, another district that was pretty rural and the dad was a farmer and the mom had five children and she was the homemaker and suddenly died of cancer. Now dad has these five children. He's a farmer. Their whole their whole life shifted. This secondary loss was one of the biggest things that we worked on with them because of all the shifts in roles in that house. There's unsolved issues. This is evident with delayed or complicated traumatic grief. This is also something that comes up with trauma. There's identity confusion. Are you, are you still a wife, a mother, a daughter, right? There's wanting to be with the loved one. That's not necessarily suicidal ideation. It's just seeking that out. There's grief bursts with no warning. And then our cognitive functioning. Thinking and decision-making is difficult. We put expectations on ourselves and what others place on us and not giving that space to really have no expectations. A big part of the grief process for our students is how the family grieves. There's a lot to unpack when a family system goes through loss. Culture and grief can be different with even within households. One of the biggest concerns when there's a loss of a parent is the parentification of one of the children. This is not necessarily the parent doing it. It could be a child that steps up to the duties of that lost parent on their own, but that other caregiver is not in a place to say, no, no, this is my role. The surviving caregiver is the role model of grief. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to be vulnerable. And it's important to talk about it. This helps to ensure one side isn't withholding in order to protect another. How many times have we heard that? Well, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to make you cry. I didn't want to hurt your feelings, right? New relationships can be difficult within family systems when people are going through grief. Introducing them to the family should be slow and ensure this person will stay. We don't see that with our families sometimes who are going through and maybe having multiple boyfriends or girlfriends coming in and out. Sometimes it's out of necessity. Sometimes this has to switch because I don't have somewhere to live or I can't afford to support us. But again, that goes into the grief of I can't grieve, now we're here. There's a lot that goes into that. Including kids in the conversation is huge. If there's one thing, if you have a family that you're dealing with in your classroom, excuse me, that is going through some sort of grief, including those kids in the conversation is huge. We'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but our brains want to finish the story. And if there isn't a finished story, our brains will finish the story. So if there was a death and, and it was maybe one of those, it was an overdose or if it was a suicide or if it was a homicide and we have little children and we don't want to talk about that, that leaves a lot to the imagination for those kids of what happened. They're going to hear little snippets and they're going to finish the story themselves. And it could be a worse story than what actually happened. So it's really important that we're encouraging those families to um, talk with their students. So cultural responsiveness, this is a model that we can work on in any situation, not just in grief work. So we have the religious and spiritual identity. Some are affected by their religion and experiences that extend beyond the ordinary, and others may not identify with religion. Economic class background, there's class standing and roles influencing the development. Sexual identity influences personal development, especially especially for those who have been oppressed because of their sexuality. Psychological maturity is the ability to respond to a situation or environment in an appropriate manner. Ethnic, cultural, racial identity. Chronologically developmental age, so physical cognition and, and psychological skill development. 
trauma and other threats to one's well-being, family history and dynamics, and unique physical characteristics, and then the location of residence and language differences. So as we're working with families, no matter in what context, this respectful model is something that we can go into every situation with in the hopes of being respectful of who we're coming into contact with. So developmental perspectives in grief, childhood attachment is huge with this. In a secure attached child, they're more flexible, they relocate the bond and it oscillates. In ambivalent, they get stuck in the emotional response, they're unable to cope constructively. Avoidant, they have a higher lack of trust, they can show more independence, but they avoid emotion. And in disorganized, they can show socially avoidant fear, rejection, but want closeness. So people with different attachment styles are going to grieve differently. And it's important that we don't judge for how they're grieving during this period, especially for those kids that have this trauma. Some people may shut down, they pull away, others may dramatize and express their feelings deeply and openly. Remember how people respond is not always a good indicator of how much they loved or did not love that person that died. So we're going to talk about different age groups, and these are generalized groupings. Remember what we just talked about with complex trauma. There can be a regression with children in grief. Clingy, separation anxiety, bedwetting, thumb sucking can be uncomfortable sometimes with the matter of fact nature that a young person may talk about the story, but it's okay. We have to be regulated ourselves in that situation. And is it us that's uncomfortable or is it really inappropriate what they're talking about in front of other people? It's important, for, again, for youth to know the story because they will finish it if they don't have it. So with kids under five, death is not seen as final. The deceased are living somewhere else or they're sleeping, right? And this is where it's really important that we use the right verbiage. When we talk about putting our animals to sleep, well, what happens then when somebody dies for those kiddos? They're just sleeping. Or what happens then to that kiddo who's going in for surgery for the first time and they say, we're going to put you to sleep. Well, that meant to my animal that they never came back. So using the right verbiage is really important. For five, five-ish to nine-ish, we're talking about speculation about their own mortality, speculation about the mortality of the adults who care for them. This is really going to come up strong if they've lost another caregiver. And then nine and older is death's avoidable. It's not inevitable. Speculation about death, activities of the death of the deceased, graves, cremation, those things may come up. <clears throat> Questions that can come up is during this time is, did I make this happen? I had a student in one district that parents, uh, he was taken through DCS for parents who were neglectful. He was with a grandmother on the track for adoption. That grandmother unfortunately had a heart attack and died. We worked with DCS very closely to make sure that this child was able to go back to the house to hear what happened. We wanted to make sure that he was grieving appropriately because this was the question that kept coming up. Did my behavior make this happen? <clears throat> Is this going to happen to me? Can I catch this? Right. That was a big thing. Um, my brother-in-law passed from cancer. And that was a big question for my kids was, can I catch this? If I go visit him, can I catch this? Self-preservation is who's going to take care of me? And then that magical thinking, I can, I can change the outcome. I could have changed that. If I would have left five minutes later, I could have changed that. And obviously we can't change the past. So working with kiddos in grief, the goal in healthy grief is to oscillate back and forth. We want to be more in restoration orientation versus the loss oriented. When we stay on that loss oriented is when we're on that kind of projection for that complex grief disorder. These are things that the school counselor, the social worker, or if they are able to see a grief counselor, these are the things that they're working on. So what does this look like in a classroom? New behavior problems or increased behavior difficulties could come up. We have those regressed behaviors, like we talked about, could be, you know, having accidents in the classroom or sucking their thumbs, um, increased uh, so anxiety when, when being taken from the other caregiver. Poor or decreased school performance, decreased concentration, somatic complaints. This happens often with our younger kids who can't get out what's really happening in their brains. 
headaches, stomach aches without other signs of illnesses, asking lots of questions about death, isolation, increased substance use. All of these pieces could be things that we're looking at in our classroom setting. So how can you support your students through this? The best thing you can do is, have, is to refer to a social worker or a school counselor because they're the ones that are really gonna be able to focus on the mental health piece. However, you can be present when they wanna talk about it. It's just if they start talking deeply, you could get stuck. So that's where it's really important to, to, to refer out for those. But having a non-judgmental, self-regulated listening ear is sometimes all they need in that moment. Again, using the words is something that is so important. We need to normalize the use of the words when we talk about grief. Um, the concreteness of the words are so important when working with all of our students and should be encouraged with families also. But again, our, our culture and our society, these words are hard to say, they're hard to grasp, they're hard to accept. And so that's where starting to normalize and use these words are gonna be really important. So what else can support look like? Remember, grief isn't a solution to be solved. It's an experience to be supported, right? We're not silver lining everything. We're sitting with them and just saying, this just stinks, right? I'm, my, I have a friend who lost a parent and she said that was the best thing when she called one of us, one of her friends. She said, that was the first thing they said, well, this just stinks. And she was like, yeah. It really does. And that was the most comforting thing she, she heard because most people were trying to seek comfort or comfort her. And she just wanted that acknowledgement that it stinks. We don't need to challenge those irrational thought patterns unless they're extremely maladaptive. And that's when that would go to a mental health professional. We want to focus on surviving inside the pain, not erasing it. It's not going to go away, right? We I lost my brother-in-law five years ago. That pain was still very present with us and still comes up. A song pops on or I think about him. His birthday's coming up, right? It's, it's going to come up. It's not ever going to go away, but I can survive within it. And we're going to walk alongside. We're not going to lead them into how they, we think that they should deal with their grief. So other ways to help in small steps of healing is supporting our students and families by encouraging routines and taking care of their hygiene. Sleep hygiene can be more effective than medication along with exercise. If we're not sleeping, there's no energy for the rest of things. Um, typically, we have melatonin up in the evening and cortisol is decreased. And in depression, we have this flipped. So that can make it really hard for individuals to sleep on a normal sleep schedule. If there's no trouble with sleep hygiene, then naps are okay. If not, then we don't do that. Personal hygiene can take a lot of effort for those individuals going through grief, but it's instrumental in keeping the other hygienes going. And then self-care. Just five minutes of physical exertion can start to decrease anxiety. Physical health often normally declines after loss, and that's okay. But then we have to start looking at eating patterns, getting into nature, and doing that physical exertion as much as we can. Again, I appreciate you having me today. Um, if you're wanting some more information on this, again, Anderson Cooper, like I said, is doing a great podcast. There's a couple great books out there. One is When Students Grieve for Teachers Grieving Student, A Teacher's Guide. There's also For Pets, When a Pet Dies, The Best Cat in the World, and Saying Goodbye to Pets You Love. So there are some great resources out there. Um, and I also have a references page, so you guys can check that out too. But I really appreciate you all being here today. I'm going to end the slideshow so I can see if there's any questions. Um, hi, Lindsay. Um, we received a question asking if we're going to receive this slideshow presentation. I know besides the hub, I didn't know if we were going to pass that out. I sent that out in an email yesterday to Jamie. Okay. So Jamie should have the slides as well as I think a couple other things. So yes, you should have, you should be able to access it. Jamie should have it. Okay. And I know I know who that is, Miss Walter. So I'll make sure that you get that. <laughs> Did anyone have any questions for Lindsay today? It was a lot of valuable information. 
needs to be talked about, um, especially as, you know, a lot of us working in education, you know, during the winter seasons, the cold seasons, a lot of our students are going through a lot. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate the fact that you're telling us, you know, be transparent with our students and really the focus on empathy, which is, I think, sometimes difficult for students to understand mm -hmm. and sometimes us as well. Mm -hmm. Just the difference. Um, I had a little question about that as well. Yeah. So um, and this is just kind of on what your you know, expertise on this. So um, when we were talking about empathy, um, you know, it's like, you know, you're feeling with people, you're kind of coming down to their level saying like, hey, this stinks, like this mm -hmm. is a bad situation. In the video, it was like, you know, I've been there. Um, but I've been seeing like a lot of things on the internet. It's like, you know, don't bring up your situation. Don't bring, you know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, I've been through this same thing, you know, it'll get better or, or trying to share your experience, what are your thoughts on that in regards to empathy? Yeah, that is that is definitely a big conversation. Um, yeah. We in our training for um, this advanced grief counseling stuff, sometimes it has to come up to make connection. Sometimes that has to be there to say, you know, I felt grief. I don't know what you're feeling. I know that grief when I was going through it was really difficult. So it's really important in those situations that you're not taking away from their experience, but, but sharing in a connecting way. Um, and that's, it's a really big balance, which therapists have to go through constantly when we're figuring out how much do we share during therapy or not. And that's the same for you all, but it really is, is my sharing. The question to ask is, is my sharing in this moment for me? Or is it in connection with the student? Okay. Is what I'm sharing making me feel better? Or is this connecting with the student in the moment? And if we kind of keep that mindset, then it's really helpful. Okay. Gretchen, Thanks. I see your mouth moving, but it looks like you're on mute. Okay, maybe she's not talking to somebody else. Sorry. Sorry, my kids are coming in. You're so fine. You're fine. Saying you're saying recording us on time. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Lindsay, for sharing your expertise on this topic today. Um, participants, before you leave, please remember to go to the chat and um, click this link. Actually, I should do that. Let me go ahead and put this in here for you guys. Click this link. It's in there right now. Sorry about that. Go ahead and click that link um, to provide some feedback and choose your free book to add to your collection. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Lindsay, and the rest of you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay and Shayla. That was great, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank it you was. so much. Thank you.